mystified. All right, welcome to episode 46 of Seize the Moment podcast. And today, we welcome back Liz Dorval. Hey, Liz. <laughs> hey, Liz, welcome back. Hi, yeah. thank you for having me again. In our trying circumstances. Welcome back. Yeah. And today, special episode, as you can see, I have gloves on. <laughs> Uh, me and Leon aren't quite social distancing, but no. Liz clearly is, and yeah. this will be our Corona episode. We're going to talk about Corona, like how we're being affected, mm -hmm. how other people around us are being affected, yeah. our thoughts. But uh, wait, since we have a podcast, does that mean that we are actually technically considered as one entity now? What do you mean? Like we're essential? Yeah. Well, no, I mean like since we don't, we're one entity, we don't have to social distance. So it's like we have Liz, and then we have the Leon and Alan combination. I feel like it's okay because we live close to each other, mm -hmm. and like we haven't seen anyone besides each other, yeah. really, so to speak. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so I think I think it's okay. I got my gloves. Mm -hmm. I don't have a mask, but do I need a mask? I don't know. What do you think, Liz? <laughs> <laughs> Liz, give us your expertise. Or mask, or mask oh yeah. By necessary. the way, to preface this, we're we're not experts, but. Of course, we're sharing I, our... They opinion. needed to know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a box of masks that I use. I couldn't find any masks here, and uh, the, the shipping and the price gouging online was ridiculous. Yeah. So I got a box of masks because I have a friend in Japan who saw what was going on in New York and actually sent me a box of masks. So I, wow. I will use the masks when I go to the grocery store and stuff. Mm-hmm. But indoors, no, I don't use a mask. It's just me. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but if you, you know, if you guys need some masks, I can I can mail you some. Have, have you been afraid coming out? A little bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't. I try to go to the store once a week. Um, I and you know I'll go to the bodega, but then I'll you know come back and like wash my hands really quick. So yeah, yeah like the anxiety is, is always is always kind of there. Mm -hmm. yeah, I feel I'll be honest too. with you, I'm a little skittish too, mm -hmm. um, especially when this whole thing was starting and I was still going to work. Mm -hmm. There was this, oh, oh, this is actually, was this last week? Maybe two weeks ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, most businesses were already starting to do the whole um, work from home thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Where I work, they didn't quite get there just yet. Mm -hmm. And I saw where this is headed, how serious this is, and mm -hmm. I'm like... Okay, uh, maybe, you know, maybe I actually took off days from work. Uh -huh. uh, I I was uh, I was actually a little bit sick, mm -hmm. but still, like I wasn't sure if I had anything or. Uh, and plus, there were all these guidelines from the CDC, like, hey, stay stay home if you're sick, mm -hmm. just in case you don't know if you have something. We don't have enough tests yet. Even if you wanted to get tested, like you couldn't. Mm -hmm. I know now it's getting progressively easier, mm -hmm. but I think you still get turned away if you don't have severe symptoms, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that train ride on the way to work, you could imagine, like, I'm... Like finally, when I decided to go back to work, and this is and this day that I was going back, I was I made sure with uh, the people I work with that we're going to start to be able to yeah. set up work from home. So mm -hmm. that's why I came in. So I start coming in. I, I get on the train, and I I was hearing from everybody, oh the trains are empty, mm -hmm. you know Times Square is empty, all this. The train I got on was not empty. Mm -hmm. There were people coughing and sneezing <laughs> left and right. I'm like, and I have a mask on and gloves, and I'm just like looking around. Oh. Well, okay, first I'll say my experience. I'm looking around, and in my mind, even though normally I have a calm, collected character, usually I'm usually like, I sit, I look around at the everything on the train, I'll listen to some music, a mm -hmm. podcast, I'll, I'll relax, right? Mm -hmm. I, that, that capability that I usually have was not with me mm -hmm. that day. I actually was looking around, like, I was like, why aren't they social why aren't they six feet apart why are some of these people coughing on each other why did some guy just wipe his nose touch the the bar and another person touch that same bar or whatever. yeah <laughs> yeah it was i was like oh no this is like we need to do something about mm -hmm. this you know <laughs> why did some guy touch his bar and then touch the bar touch his face <laughs> 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 he's like all up in there goes from the bar to his nose to his ear yeah um, yeah you're really everyone now and like when I go mm -hmm. to the grocery store uh, like I will wear a mask and gloves mm -hmm. and nobody around me is yeah. and I'm just looking at them and 
they're looking at me and we're both like looking at each other and they're looking at me suspiciously by the way because i'm wearing a mask and i'm looking at them suspiciously because <laughs> they're not wearing a mask exactly. yeah. and i'm like i'm like i'm not like you know i'm protecting myself from you just like you should be protecting yourself from me mm-hmm. and the aisles are really really narrow please yeah. wear a mask like <laughs> yeah i hear you on that so one thing um I hear different arguments for the wearing a mask thing. I hear, as far as the CDC is concerned, you should really only be wearing a mask if you have any kind of symptoms, if you're even kind of sick. So this way, any kind of droplets or anything like that doesn't kind of go past the area of the mask onto someone else. However, the thing that I see as a whole in that logic is if you're asymptomatic, and let's say you're highly infectious, but you don't have any symptoms yet. Mm-hmm. And let's say it's all... So I'm getting this from... Um, there's this... Uh, he's the director for the Center of Infectious Disease Research. His name is Michael Osterholm. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was on a uh, Rogan show. He's on other uh, media outlets as well, um, explaining what, what's going on in the past few weeks, right? And he, he says that you could actually catch it in the air, right? Uh, just even even breathing in the same room as somebody. So I was thinking, okay, well then maybe I should wear a mask anyway, right? What if I'm asymptomatic? I wouldn't know. There aren't enough tests yet to really know. So why not play it safe? Even if it might be, you might be doing a little much, Mm -hmm. right? Um, But again, uh, if you still check the CDC guidelines, they still don't recommend wearing it unless you have something. Mm -hmm. So my hands are up in the air as far as that one goes. That's just me probably being a little, what, cautious, you want to say, paranoid? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't think it's paranoid at all. I think it's common sense, considering, yeah, you can be asymptomatic and still spread it. It's really, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer that if you, if you are able to have a mask, just to just wear it. Yeah. I mean, and the quicker that we do that, the quicker all this will be over, so... Yeah, and so what's driving me crazy is literally all of the people who refuse to comply, man. Like, I told you guys, obviously, in private, that, like, um, so every week I obviously go to my mom's place because I go to visit her. And, I'm like, yo, man, I'm coming outside and everybody's chilling, hanging out, going to the park. People are, like, playing basketball and stuff. I'm like, yo, I don't understand. Yeah. Like, guys, what are you doing? You're literally not only making this worse for yourselves, you're making this worse for everybody else. So, yeah. like, um, so obviously, as, you know, stuff that we talk about on this show, like we talk about like different distortions and kind of distorted ways of thinking and of seeing the world and so like i actually started reading about it and so um because i'm like really trying to figure out like why people are being assholes right (laughs) yeah that's like the first thought obviously it's like yo you guys are just like literally assholes you're like not taking this seriously and you're endangering everybody else what is that called uh normalcy bias oh um what was that that one i don't remember that's where it can't happen to you yeah so yeah yeah Oh, that, okay. that, that, so that's one of them. So pretty much there are like, a, I guess, maybe four or five biases involved. So yeah, so that's definitely one of them. So the other one is obviously wishful thinking that there are like people who just are like, oh, well, if I just kind of like pretend it won't exist or it doesn't exist or that it won't hurt me in some way, kind of it won't hurt me. Mm. And then like the other thing that I remember that came up was, um, oh, freedom, right? So because obviously this country is like based on the notion of freedom that for us, we think like, oh, as long as I like kind of grip my teeth and I sort of like, you know, fight for what I'm supposed to be allowed to do right then kind of like this thing is just going to blow over on its own which i it has to be kind of connected to wishful thinking. So my thinking is like you have like these kind of um, these different distortions which can even all work together that obviously kind of turn into people not doing what they're supposed to do. So I mean like I don't know what do you guys think like how do we, how will we I guess combat that? I think just knowledge not enough people are actually informed about how this spreads like a lot of people are getting the basic information of wash your hands right yeah uh, a lot of people are into the whole hand sanitizer thing mm-hmm. let's let's put toilet paper on the side for mm-hmm. now but uh call it? <laughs> yeah uh people are aware to not touch your own face yeah. right Mo- most people are aware of things like that mm-hmm. um but they they aren't aware of certain things that the infectious disease researchers are kind of putting out there like again going back to Michael Osterholm, if you can just spread it by being in the same room and breathing the same air as someone, mm-hmm. forgetting whether you coughed or you sneezed, mm-hmm. that's, uh, I mean, even arguably us, I mean, I haven't gone anywhere uh, for close to two weeks now. Right. So I think for anyone watching, if they're like, hey, these guys are uh, mm-hmm. too close <laughs> right now, right? Like we both haven't really been anywhere. Um, 
as far as that goes, except for with each other. So you could you could argue that probably there's nothing to worry about. But mm -hmm. even then, there's this, this sort of thing in the back of my mind where I'm like, no, you should still be careful. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think knowledge, uh, knowledge of how, how this spreads is important. Also knowing that, uh, so a lot of people think that this is like an old person's disease, right? Because the mortality rate is higher for people in their uh, 80s, mm -hmm. right? But there are people actually who are getting severely sick in their, uh, between their 40s and 60s, right? right? And a lot of- And their 20s and 30s. And their 20s and 30s. Not a lot of people. Um, so th these people aren't necessarily dying, right? But they are getting severely sick. Yeah. And there are some cases of people dying. Like for example, in California, there was a 17 year old uh, who yeah. died from coronavirus complications. He couldn't breathe. He went to an urgent care. And because he didn't have his insurance, he was turned away. And he was asked to go to the nearest hospital or something like that. By the time the ambulance yeah. comes and they try to kind of resuscitate him, and uh, all that he actually ends up dying right which is actually a, a, a real wake-up call which is forgetting even the impact of not having insurance or whether he should have had insurance or how that even works mm -hmm. in the first place even even the fact that say say we got to a situation why are we doing the social distancing thing right it's to flatten the curve mm -hmm. meaning what meaning that by less people being out there, there's less people getting sick, and then the, there's less people kind of coming to the hospital who aren't able, who are getting those serious cases of not being able to breathe without a ventilator. Mm -hmm. Now we have a limited amount of ventilators. Uh, let's say in New York, right? If the amount of cases surged to a point where the amount of people that needed ventilators exceeded the amount of ventilators that we had, mm -hmm. then it stops that myth about just the old people dying. Really stops there. Right, forgetting even these cases of some people just dying in uh, uh, in other age ranges, right. more people would just die because then you don't have someone you could uh, give a ventilator to. Not mm -hmm. give one, but you know, use a ventilator on, right. and then you'll start having way more complications mm -hmm. um, and way more deaths. So, so it's a, it's a very serious thing when uh, people are advising to social distance, like that. That's why we shouldn't be out there for non-essential reasons, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, and like challenging now the biases is going to be like a huge problem. I mean, whatever. I mean, problem. Maybe that's not the right word for it, but it's a huge, definitely endeavor. And so, wait, can I read you guys like what the distortions are? That like, um, so there was this really. So she's like a really great. I guess I think she's a clinical site. No, she's not. She thinks she's a research psychologist. So the way she kind of framed it was like, so she's um an expert on evil and like kind of you know dangerous people and dangerous behavior. And so the way she kind of conceptualized it was that obviously kind of the go to that we go to is like, oh, like these people are assholes, like they are shitty people or whatever, right? Which is obviously my go to. So, but the way she kind of different, yeah, that was literally my first response i was like these people are like the scummiest people ever man so the way she kind of um so the way she just you know sort of broke it down was well and she actually has a solution too but the way she broke it down was pretty much figuring out what the distortions are obviously underlying you know kind of the rebelliousness beyond beneath you know kind of the i guess inability or unwillingness to abide by the rules mm -hmm. so she pretty much pointed out let me see. All right. So she said the first one was, we can't grasp it. She wrote, humans struggle to grasp complex problems. It feels like we're in a dystopian movie rather than real life. The almost impossibility of grasping this pandemic can lead to ignoring or denying the scale and reality of it altogether. So pretty much people are in denial. Um, the second one was we engage in wishful thinking. In the digital age, it doesn't take long to find an article that tells you what you want to hear. Wishful thinking can lead to cherry picking statements that minimize or catastrophize the severity of the situation. If you have the misconception that the world is ending, you may stockpile to excess and deplete resources for those in need. If you have the misconception that it's no worse than the flu, you put others at risk by socializing as you normally would. Number three is that we don't believe it. Our news feeds have long been filtered with sensationalized stories. If we are constantly told that our world is in crisis, we may not take the news seriously when it tries to convince us that the crisis is, this crisis is different. We may become desensitized by the news that cries wolf. And the last one is we are confused. We don't know what we should do. What we did yesterday while following go government guidance may today be seen as a faux pas. This leads to learned helplessness where we may try to give up or we, we may just give up trying to figure out how to behave correctly and instead use our intuition as a guide. And so just to kind of to give her credit, because obviously she deserves it. Her name is Dr. Julia Shaw, and the article is titled Why Some People Are Still Not Staying at Home. Research Explains Our Psychological Response to COVID-19.
So pretty much her idea is that there are a bunch of cognitive distortions underlying all of this. It's not obviously that just people are assholes. That like kind of going back to Alan's point that we need more knowledge and we need more information and people need to kind of have a better understanding of why they're making the decisions that they make. We also need to hear consistent messaging from our leaders yeah. because nope. we're hearing different things from everybody mm -hmm. and that's confusing if you don't know what to believe. If, if our leaders can't even agree, <clears throat> excuse me, if our leaders can't even agree on the scope of this pandemic and what needs to, and what uh, restrictions need to happen, mm -hmm. then no one's going to listen, period. Yeah. There, needs to be, there needs to be something consistent across the board. And like right now, I'm really just taking directions from Cuomo. Um, I'm really not popping into well, watching the uh, White House briefing every day. It's just I'm just really kind of focusing on because I think Cuomo really has the most consistent message. Yeah. And that's really my go to right now. Yeah. No, he's so. great. He, the way he's handling everything. I, I got to hand it to him. Uh, arguably, I mean, so on one level, um, I think closing down every business except for the non essential, except for the essential ones. Right. Um, ultimately, that's a that's a good move. Yeah. Right. Uh, to limit uh, movement so people can stay home, flatten the curve. Right. right. Um, so uh, there's not too much of a conflict, but my dad, for instance, right? He, he's a business owner. He works in a restaurant uh, food supply. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, if he was not told to stay home, mm -hmm. despite mm -hmm. all the news and despite what I was telling him even a week or even to two weeks prior, mm -hmm. uh, he would have still been going to and from work, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. And mm -hmm. although chances are he could have been fine, even with certain protections in place and washing your hands and all that, it's not like he wasn't careful. Mm -hmm. But that actually eased my anxiety that about that because like th there were time there were actually a couple of nights I couldn't sleep because yeah. I started thinking about like my parents or even other people who are like not paying attention to what's going on and how this could kind of cascade into bigger issues. Mm -hmm. Now that moment th those moments that i was experiencing that that was before we started setting in place these these newer rules right mm -hmm. uh so arguably uh cuomo saved my dad's life actually mm -hmm. I, I like to think of it like that mm -hmm. so i kind of i i love cuomo for that mm -hmm. you know i didn't know much about him before mm -hmm. uh except for like his brother's chris cuomo mm -hmm. and the whole well forget it <laughs> things like that i was gonna go into a whole the whole fredo thing <laughs> or whatever but that's a different conversation okay. For a different time, <laughs> mm -hmm. but like, yeah. So he's great, and but I do have to hand it to the um, to the White House as far as uh, at least them doing consistent briefings every day. Like, uh, <laughs> you mean their jobs? Hey, come on! <laughs> I hear. <laughs> no, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. It's just um. Hmm. I, you, I appreciate that they're doing these briefings. Have I listened to every single briefing? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, because I do know that, for example, Trump and Cuomo are at odds, mm -hmm. especially right now. Yeah. Um, they shouldn't be, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So I do tend to also just listen to Cuomo, especially since he's really taking care of everything mm -hmm. here. I hear you. But it is good that they're they're you know consistently putting out mm -hmm. messages. Yeah. Yeah. I would prefer if it was just. Uh, Dr. Fauci mm -hmm. speaking every day instead of Trump's running commentary about how the governors aren't nice enough. It's just yeah, yeah, Pence. yeah. Just put, just put Fauci up there, and that'll be sufficient. Yeah, I hear you. Um, I I wonder if it okay. So I'm not making any excuse for Trump at all. I just wonder if um, there there might be a purpose as to why he keeps saying like uh, we're gonna um, see what's going on by Easter or something like that. Or I hope to open the economy back up, right? When I first heard that, my initial reaction was like, no, listen to the doctors. Listen to all the doctors. They're all saying the same thing unanimously. There's nobody who's like saying, we're going to be good by April. Mm -hmm. Everyone just has, if, if they do say anything different, some person says three months, some person says six months, another person says nine months, right? Mm -hmm. That's usually the difference I'm hearing between these uh, uh, experts, right? Mm -hmm. But nothing about April, and it's, just, it's very alarming when I first heard that. Mm -hmm. But then I started to think about, I'm wondering if he's doing that so the, the, so the, the public doesn't go nuts. Maybe so this way they're thinking, okay, it could be over by this date, right? And then it's really not going to be, but it's just being said that way just to get people to... Yeah. 
calm down. But I might be making an allowance for uh, the Trump administration by yeah. saying it that. It just doesn't fit his personality, in my opinion. Uh, you know, when, he's, when he makes these statements, even when the pandemic was first starting, he's like, oh, we have 15 cases. It's going to go down to zero. Anybody who wants a test can get a test. These like yeah. when he says these things and oh we're gonna you know we're gonna have packed churches by Easter, it's really it has no uh, no root in truth. It's just really him hoping that whatever he's saying will go out into the void and become truth. Wishful it's, thinking. It's wishful thinking. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. He's like, yeah, this this will happen. It's like it really won't. He would like it to be, mm-hmm. but you know you really got to take it from where it comes. It's. Yeah, it's and, optimistic. Yeah, and maybe it's okay. even delusional. No, maybe he's yeah. maybe he's even convinced that that's the case. That's what's actually scary to have someone that delusional. I'm so serious. Oh my god, <laughs> that's Fair it's enough. it's scary. No, but seriously, like, so there are people obviously who are like too pessimistic, where like no matter what you talk to them about, for I don't know whatever. Let me not say always because it's too blanket of a term, obviously. But like there are people who you know you kind of um percent different data points to and they're like overly negative right where no matter what happens they always like disqualify the evidence they're like oh that doesn't count because of such and such but then you have people who are like too positive where like they're like oh no 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 no, we don't have to take all of these precautions that's absolutely okay because by april everything is going to be back to normal what do yeah. we care yeah so like too much positive where do you guys stand? oh so i, I said we waited out yeah no, 100%. I mean, I'm not negative about it in the sense of I don't think we're going to end up with, it's like China. Because I don't know that. I mean, we could, but I don't think so. I mean, right now, I think I'm literally at the place of pure uncertainty. I just don't know. That's it. That's where I stand. I mean, I'm with you there. Yeah. I definitely don't know. But I'll, I'll say this. Uh, even if we wanted to do some kind of best of both worlds approach, where you somehow get people working again amidst all this... I don't know how you what's what kind of logistics you'd be employing to make that work. Mm-hmm. For example, even if you tried something like saying, uh, "Oh, okay, so we only want the young people in the workforce mm-hmm. to re-enter, you know, go back to business. Anyone who's doing anything physical, right. uh, we want only the young people." Right? Mm-hmm. It does. I don't know. Does you'd have to really have an expert take a look at that idea Mm -hmm. and break down why it could work and why it couldn't work and then really weigh that out uh i don't think as things stand that we should um be be going back to business as usual anytime soon Mm -hmm. uh but if anyone wanted to get creative i welcome it just please present it in a way or not present it in a way just make it make sense if you're going to in a way that still goes with the cdc guidelines and the way that still is listening to all these infectious disease researchers right to dr fauci right well remember so uh in the uk they advocate advocated for uh, herd immunity and then boris johnson got the corona <laughs> so yeah. wild man so wild and but they're that, doing a six-month lockdown right i actually i don't know that for the, i don't know what they're doing in the uk. uh yeah are I, they I, yeah they could be. They could Please be. fact check me. Yeah, we need a Jamie. We need a Jamie. <laughs> we need a Jamie. <laughs> yeah, I don't. But know. like, I believe it's six months, especially okay. like right after he got it. He, yeah. Yeah, and also he's getting police to enforce people not to be too close to each other outside. Yeah. And all that. Actually, I don't mind that approach, mm-hmm. given the seriousness of the situation. Right. I don't mind it. But then, if you ask like some of our friends, mm-hmm. totally against it. They <laughs> think they. You don't want to start taking away certain freedoms because it's a slippery slope. And I can I mention Please. something about that? So when I, I think in terms of like the distorted thinking styles, um, I don't know if this is necessary. No, so this is not a distortion, but I think it's definitely, I guess. Uh, let me see. How I could put this. It's um, it's definitely, I guess, a psychological quirk that I think most people experience, especially like when unchecked. So what happens is obviously, I think, because like our country is like obsessed with freedom, which it should be, obviously, because freedom is important to just being a human being. So for them, it's like if there's, um, let's say, if there's some sort of let's say impending sense of doom or tragedy or whatever i guess no there is a distortion connected to this because it is a form of denial so it's like for them if they can kind of assert their freedom in some way there's some part of them that feels that they're in control so it's like if i can just sort of establish my sense of freedom right and i could feel in control of the situation then somehow in some way i don't know what the thinking would be for you know kind of um i guess in this respect or what it would be like for different people and experience again but it's like in some way if we can experience ourselves as free then we could then control 
it. And it's like, and then if we can control it, we can overcome it. So I think that for, so just to kind of try to empathize with people who like really want freedom at this point, my thinking is because we are so, I think ubiquitously anxious about the scenario that for us to just feel the sense of freedom makes us then feel like we can overcome the virus. Unfortunately, because this is a form of denial, it's not true. You being free is not going to help you in obviously any sort of way overcome the virus. You actually at this point, and I know people are going to hate this, you need less freedom. You need more limitation and more restriction. They actually, it's like, it's counterintuitive for us. Because the way we think of it as is freedom equals, um, what would you call it? So freedom equals resolve and resolve equals sort of the ability to overcome, you know, difficulties, right? So the way our thinking goes is that in order to obviously overcome the virus, we first need freedom. Because if we can't act, how can we actually do anything about it? But in this case, counterintuitively, I really believe that we need more limited freedom, right? Or rather limitations, like significant limitations where we stay indoors and actually feel like we're on free because in that sense of, let's say, uh, whatever, I'm going to, I'll use this word, um, that sense of kind of being locked in, the way, unfortunately, even though, again, it's counterintuitive, that's actually the only thing that can kind of spur us to overcome this thing. And it's like, in this case, freedom is the antithesis of literally well-being. What would you both say to, I acknowledge that, by the way, I completely see the, the, the point in that. I think if, if we temporarily, yeah. everyone had to stay inside, we could deal with this thing as, as cases come, mm -hmm. right? And maybe figure something out, right? Uh, along with any other developments that sort of uh, appear as time goes by, maybe treatments, who, who knows? That, that there, there are lots of causes for hope. Right. Not like, I'm not trying to do happy talk here, but you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then what would you say if, uh, for example, um, so Trump the other day was considering quarantining uh, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York, yeah. right? Uh, for a short-term period, like two weeks or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. And Cuomo was completely against it. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's already been stated by right. Trump and Cuomo both that it's not going to happen, no mm -hmm. quarantine. Uh -huh. Cuomo says that it would cause uh, chaos, mm -hmm. that people would react adversely to that. They might. And I wonder what's making him say that. Yeah. Maybe there's some factor that we're missing out on that's yeah. that's why that's supporting his reason for for saying that. Well, do you guys think that it's possible that maybe people like um, find it hard to like they find it hard to um, I guess engage in kind of nuanced thinking in this where they equate lack of freedom with being in prison. Where it's not like, no, we're taking away your freedom for this time for the good of all. And they're equating it with, oh, I'm not free, therefore I'm locked up for like some unjust reason. Where it's like for them, it's kind of like a caged animal, right? Where it's like, how dare you lock me up? I don't deserve this. Now let me kind of try to retaliate or escape. <clears throat> That's a very immature way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And the at the end of the day, these... Uh, you know, extraordinary measures are required for extraordinary circumstances. Right. I mean, nobody likes this. Right. I'm an extrovert. I am crawling out of my skin. Mm -hmm. I hate this. Mm -hmm. I, honest to God, I'm going nuts. Mm -hmm. But it can't be helped. Right. Right? It's, people are dying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have, you know, it's, we really just have to kind of put aside this individual individualistic streak and at the end, a lot of good might come out of this, where we do learn to be more cooperative with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's this kind of, I'm actually, I'm really curious to see how uh, our social structure is going to shift and change when this is all over. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be the same. And uh, so although I am very, very frustrated and going crazy, I'm really looking at this with a sense of fascination. Yeah. Mm. Because nothing is going to this end after this. Nothing. Yeah. I'm with you as far as that goes. I mean, one thing I really love, it, it, this is, this is if I had to find something to, to love. <laughs> to love. I love it. Good term. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's that while we're doing um, the whole social distancing thing, we're not going out to hang out yeah. at all, really. I mean, except for literally now to do the podcast. Yes. But like, what's great is when we're doing our group chats, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that, aren't we doing that more often than how much we actually hung out <laughs> once a week or once a whatever That's it was, true. once every two weeks? Mm -hmm. That's interesting to me. So it kind of brought people yeah. closer together. Mm -hmm. Also, we're all kind of sharing the same, we all have a common enemy, right? Or a common 
uh, experience that we're all going through of being inside. Right. It doesn't matter if you're rich or you're, I mean, okay, well, if you're super poor and don't have somewhere to be in, that's an exception. But let's say you're at home, but not, you know, right. living below certain means mm -hmm. and a rich person, everybody's still, you know, staying inside. Mm -hmm. So you got this common thing that all these people are going through together. And there's something to that. Uh, I don't know. Do, do you guys um, agree or maybe see something to it? Because it's, it's interesting. We're, we're all, mm, for example, mm -hmm. like a little bit later, we want to do uh, this for the audience. Like <laughs> We're going to do a watch party later, mm -hmm. right? Uh, instead yeah. of all going to the movie theater, we're all going to put on probably a movie on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I think it's a platform, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, the platform. The platform, hear good things. Mm -hmm. And we're all going to watch it like that and we'll all have our like webcams of our reactions and all that. And when have we ever done anything like that? That's true. And it's cool yeah. too. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you get to see everybody's uh, face. <laughs> Somebody could be secretly recording. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Don't do I, it, Liz. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm really looking forward to it. There are some bright spots to it. And this is really, to an extent, this uh, this virus, you know, of course, it's transcending uh, class barriers, although all the rich New Yorkers are going to East Hampton. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and some people, although we do have to remain inside, it is hitting some people. Like, we as a group, like, we're, we actually got by pretty easy because we're all, like, uh, most of us still have our jobs. Mm -hmm. And we're working from home. Yeah. And that's good. Uh, but <clears throat> mm. for... Like, so we're actually, we're very, we're very, th um, you know, fortunate in that regard. I, I, I'm really worried about, you know, when I, when I get super frustrated about, about this, I have to remember like, okay, like I do, I do still have my job. I'm still working. Imagine if you were stuck inside with like a bunch of kids and no job mm -hmm. and you can't go outside and nobody's hiring right now. No. I, that is just it's serious. It's so serious. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, uh, it's, yeah. There are some people who are going through the worst like situation possible because here's the thing, especially uh, uh, did, did we even get a date on when those uh, stimulus checks are going out? Oh, so apparently, I think it was Nick who told us, or our friend Nick. Um, so I think he said that if like you have a direct deposit, it just goes straight in it. And if you don't, you have to wait like four months. Okay, but okay, but say even I you're okay. I think mid April. I think mid April. Oh, mid April. Okay. They're gonna be, they're gonna be start be dispersed. Yeah. 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 So that's still complicated, though, mm -hmm. right? Because um, this issue. When did this issue begin? Middle of March, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Some people live uh, get paid week to week, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, unemployment, for example, in New York. Mm -hmm. um, I believe there was a record high uh, amount of people who applied for. Um, unemployment and crash the website mm -hmm. therefore blocking other people from being able to apply mm -hmm. um it, it, it's yeah it's it's rough it's definitely rough for a lot of people mm -hmm. and um, 1200 is not enough no. it's not well that's if you're an individual if if you have a family like uh okay say it's this composition uh man so husband wife and let's say three kids so husband and wife, $2,400. And then for each kid, it's $500. Um, so, I mean, they do get uh, a, a, a decent sum of money. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's five, it's, it's 12 each for the adults and then 500 per child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's actually, that's, that's not bad, right? Especially if there's the whole 90 day rent moratorium that uh, Cuomo put out, at least for New York. Yeah where you don't necessarily have to be paying your rent and you don't have you won't be forced to be evicted if you don't pay it. Mm -hmm. You can conserve whatever resources you have until you get that money. Mm -hmm. But there's probably some people again live paycheck to paycheck. So maybe they mm -hmm. didn't have any resources and they're really mm -hmm. waiting for this stimulus. Yeah. Right? And it's, it's complicated. Complicated. maybe even pushing the it. The majority off. of Americans I think have less than a grand in savings. Yeah, they so, do. Something like 40% of people don't even have like 400 bucks in the account. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think Canada is giving their citizens 2000 a month. Wow. So great. You get that, you, you know, like Americans are going to be getting, you know, some money in mid April. Mm -hmm. What about the next month? Yeah. And rent and rent in New York, it's like 1200 is 
I don't know. Um, that's if you have a roommate. Maybe then that covers your that's share. True. Yeah. Well, yeah. it depends. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, unless you live like in a studio, so. Yeah, but a one bedroom on average? Yeah. Uh, now? Mm hmm. Well, you could find it cheaper. Uh, so if you if you're trying to find a studio, mm -hmm. maybe fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to uh, find a one bedroom, anywhere ranging, it depends on the quality of the place. But I've seen, uh, you could probably find it cheaper than seventeen hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. But I've seen seventeen hundred, for example, mm -hmm. as far as that goes. Yeah. So twelve hundred does not cut it for a single person. No. Then for getting groceries uh and. You she sent me a message yesterday because I'm apartment hunting, and she said, oh, I know about, about a room uh, near Atlantic Barclays, and the rent for the room, and, you know, you'd have a roommate, is 1100 That's crazy. One room, yeah. <laughs> wow, man. Wow. Yeah. Just for one room? One room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you could definitely find a better uh, deal than that, for sure. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm looking. Yeah. Damn, so if you know man. anything. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. So just to kind of go back to sort of behaviors. And so what's so interesting about the Julia Shaw article was that she was like, so you know how we were obviously talking about kind of spreading knowledge and whatnot, which is at least definitely to me really important. What she actually said was that you have to actually in this case lead by example. So you know, you guys I'm assuming know how like, you know, moods are contagious and even like how beliefs are contagious. So obviously, you know, you grow up in a particular family that has a belief system, you're going to have it, right? So if you grew up in a Republican household, there's like a 90% chance you're going to be a Republican. Same thing for Democrats, etc. Right. And so obviously, if you're around a lot of like, I know you, Liz, are the exception. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. So um, and the point is like, and with moods, right, obviously, if you're around somebody who's struggling with depression, there's a very good chance that, you know, you're going to sort of internalize that as well. So she yeah. says it's actually the same thing with behaviors. And so her argument is like, it's not so much about the information as it is about the actual doing. So she says, like, if we can actually spread what's what she calls, and I'm sure this is not her term but i mean she used it and i like it she's like if we spread what's called like behavior contagion what happens is that more and more people will start isolating so she says if you think about it like this right we have like these little networks and these little clusters of let's say you know our groups right so if we have one person who decides to isolate then that one person she says can actually like at least get two more people to do the same right just literally by example so somebody will be like oh like why is that person doing it and maybe they'll ask them and then they'll kind of learn about it and be like oh no that actually makes sense you're what you're doing is like legitimate right so obviously it's not going to be a lot of people who will follow the lead but at least some right so she says if every single person can do this and that, uh, like literally bring along with them like two at least two people with them who can kind of follow suit and you know kind of um, pretty much enact the same sort of activity or behaviors that you know kind of the isolator is doing so what we could do is actually we can make it much more likely that people will start isolating so it's like these little clusters like of leaders right who are doing that will actually contagiously or I guess you know kind of for lack of a better term so so will sort of contain or um, what's the word? They will um, infect in some way, like other people who will then in turn will see what they're doing, kind of figure out like why it is they're doing it, and then will in turn obviously do the same thing. It'll become set an example. Yeah, mm -hmm. it'll set an example. It'll become yeah. viral. It will. Yeah. yeah I, just have to, I have to do that. And I got to tell you, it's just to give this guy over here some credit. So in the beginning, I actually thought the coronavirus was shit. And Alan was like, yo, listen, we got to take this seriously. And I was like, oh my God, here goes Alan trying to impinge on my freedom. I was actually, I'm <laughs> not kidding. I was like, yo. And I think I said something like that to him where I was like, listen, bro, I'm going to literally do what I want to do. Okay. I was like, I don't know why, why you're telling me what I'm supposed to do. So I was like, one of these assholes, right? So and like, as like kind of you know as things obviously started progressing and like so i already had alan like in the back of my mind you know with what he said to me and then i and so what it was was that somewhere in the back of my mind even though i didn't believe it i at least had like a little bit of doubt in terms of the way I was thinking, right? So what happened was obviously after more and more evidence started piling up, right? You know, kind of that doubt turned into literally this whole other belief, which was like, oh shit, this is actually really serious and we should actually be listening to the experts. But it all started with you, man. Yeah, it's hilarious. Like uh, we went to a diner to eat some food. <laughs> yeah. And that's the day he's like, no, I'm not taking this. I'm going to do what I want. Yeah. And then the next day they close all the restaurants. <laughs> That was literally it, man. And then I was like, all right. All right, maybe he has a point. Yeah, I was like, okay, no, this actually makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was, on a, that was on a Saturday, right? Uh, like two Saturdays ago? Two Sundays ago. Two Sundays ago. Yeah, right. that was literally the last time we had the chance to actually do anything outdoors. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, was in a, I was in a wine bar right before all the businesses were ordered to shut down. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like, and w- when I went there, all the workers had gloves on and all the seats were like six, six feet apart. Mm-hmm. It was just like, you know, I had to sit all the way out, all across on the other side of this other woman. Mm-hmm. And this woman started coughing and I was just like, oh shit. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I was getting all suspicious. And then like the next day, yeah. Mm-hmm. Damn. That was it. Yeah, so it's like little by little. Can I read you guys what she wrote about behavior contagion? I thought it was like really good. Yeah. Okay, so it's like really quick. Uh, Okay. Uh, All right. So she pretty much said, where is it? So, all right. So pretty much she said behavior contagion can, well, this is a quote of her. Oh, she quoted someone else. She said behavior contagion can mirror and match the actual physical contagion of an infectious illness and an outbreak. So she pretty much says just like a person who's having like a COV, COVID-19 is likely to spread the disease to two or three other people. The same is true for behavior. So one person refusing to socially distance may influence two or more others to do the same. Obviously, negatively, this can influence the spread of the disease. But but she said the reverse is true. So adhering to advice given by epidem- ep- epidemiologists is also contagious. So if we stay home, we are likely to motivate two or three other people to do the same. And she said pretty much don't let your brain trick you into assuming that people who aren't socially distancing are necessarily selfish and to kind of convince others to stay home, which is pretty much she's saying is like the best thing that you could do. So I guess that's what this show is about, maybe, at least partially. Trying to kind of get others to see like, hey... What? In that case, <laughs> um, then the next show should be on Zoom or Skype. Yeah, I hear. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I feel like as as I'm listening to that, I'm like, well, you know, I mean, I'm wearing gloves, so that's kind of leadery. Yes. Right. As far as that uh-huh. goes, but we're not sitting six feet apart. But I mean, Liz, Liz is Liz is doing it right. She's at home. You but know? I mean, we live yeah. next to each other, so it's not like I don't think social distancing should, by the way, be that extreme because there are people who like hang out with their families. Yeah, but even then, two, three, and we're back. All yes. Right. <laughs> All right. So we got we got disconnected due to Corona complications, but we are back, guys. Yes. All right. So yeah, uh, what were we talking about? Before? So yeah, at the end there, where it cut off, I was saying that oh, I still go to see my right. parents. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, just more for essential reasons, like I'll get uh, I'll get groceries. I'll br- I'll bring it to them. Mm-hmm. Um, avoid contact, pretty much, uh, only because. I'm a little paranoid. I don't want... Imagine being the cause of your parents' death. Like, you literally come in all asymptomatic-like. Yeah. You breathe on them. And all of a sudden, it's like, I thought I trusted you. (laughs) And then, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so don't want to do that. I can't go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think it's okay to still see your folks. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's unhealthy not to, Mm -hmm. also. Yeah. And by the way, I actually, like, really enjoy coming here. So it's hard for me to stay away. Because, like, for me, for, like, the week, this is, like, literally what I look forward to. Like, actually being here for the podcast. Same. That's what sucks. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's, like, my thing, man. I'm like, damn, like, this is this is what we do, man. We're in this room, and this room is, like, magical. I know. But <laughs> if, if, uh, if we do want to, you know, yeah. set a good example, mm-hmm. maybe the next one should be remote. But maybe. whatever. We'll, 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 we'll see, see how that we'll works. See. We'll see how we're all feeling. So what are you guys doing to fill your time when you're at home? Oh, good question. Um, so I've been doing a lot of writing. Well, not a lot. Okay, that's sort of an exaggeration. But I've been doing some writing. Um, I'm doing like writing uh, group sessions, like on Zoom. So like where people will actually like chat with each other, but they'll just write. So it's like shut up and write sessions, but like through Zoom. So this way, like you're pretty much, you have the impetus to write. Hmm. Oh, man, can you, I want I do that. Wait, you want to join? I'm having. Join? Yeah, dude. I'm yeah. Ha- I'm having one with Sky and Jamie at three o'clock. You want to join? Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. I'll cool. let them know that you're coming through. I'm writing an article right now, so that's a. Oh. Good thing. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So yes, yeah, so I'm doing that. Um, so I'm writing like on my own too, obviously, and I'm reading. Um, so hopefully we'll have him on sometime soon. I'm reading this book. So he's supposed to be our guest sometime in the future, John Cag. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm trying to get through this. So this has been a really good book. Six yeah. Souls, Healthy yeah, Minds. Six Souls, Healthy Minds. And so trying to I'm get... I'm trying to... Hmm. Oh, go on. No, I was going to say, so yeah, I'm trying to get through this. I'm doing some writing. And so obviously I'm still working, so I'm working from home. But that's literally it. And then talking to you guys through Zoom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm trying to get through this backlog of poli-sci books. Mm-hmm. Why, what are you reading? Uh, 
I'm reading a couple of things. Hold on, let me grab them. Oh, cool. Hmm. Uh, I've been slowly going through this book, mm -hmm. Whoa. The End of Power, which nice. is really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm writing a bunch of notes on it because I want to uh, kind of discuss that in the article that I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you gave me this book, Leon, and I'm going through it. Yes. Well. So that was actually given to me by my mentor. Mm -hmm. He had the political brain. I got through like yeah. one chapter of it and I just, it wasn't for me. <laughs> yeah. Why? It's super dry. Like, um, so it's so my thing is like, look, I love academic -y stuff up until a point. So he is like very like factually based, right? So it's pretty much like I like psychology books because like for the most part you get to read about people's lives, right? So like this book, which is about William James and even the author, like so John Cag pretty much talks about his life in it too. To me, that's like super interesting. So that person talks a lot about data points. So he talks about research. He talks about pretty much how like emotions affect the political sphere, which is like interesting. But my thinking is it's like he goes so so detailed into it and talks about like different studies and it just becomes really boring mm -hmm. i couldn't get through it do you uh, like it so far yeah i like it oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about you me lately i've been listening to a lot of podcasts mm -hmm. it, it's it's great uh i haven't had this much free time for i think a year or a couple of years mm -hmm. actually uh i've been listening just learning just a lot of learning. Yeah. Um, there's this podcast called, it's by, uh, you might have heard of him, maybe not. Mm -hmm. His name's Tom Bilyeu. Mm -hmm. um, so he does this, um, it's called Impact Theory. Mm -hmm. So what he does is he'll have different guests on, whether they're a health expert, uh, mathematician, neurologist, chemist, philosopher. Yeah. Um, he's had people like Sam Harris on or uh, Eric Weinstein, mm -hmm. for example. Oh, dope. Yeah, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. Quality guess, quality okay. guess. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I was listening to one recently with a uh, neurologist on there and he was explaining how we don't actually have free will mm -hmm. and how a certain series of experiments prove that. Mm -hmm. And it was so fascinating. Then you talk about the libid experiments? Uh, no, what's that? Oh, um, okay. So just in a nutshell, because this would take like uh, some time. Um, so pretty much in a nutshell, what they find is that like when they look at people's brains or what found, obviously, I think this was done in the fifties. So when they look at people's brains, they see the part that's related to decision making is activated like one third of a second before they actually make the decision in reality. But here's the thing though. So now what they're actually seeing is that, so people are pretty much, so the major problem with those studies was that like pretty much the, the time when you would make a decision that's actually self-reported unfortunately people are kind of pretty shitty at timing when they do things so the thing is like what they found is on average is that like they're like oh well so their brain centers that are related to decision making light up before they actually report having made those decisions but people are so bad at like reporting the exact second that they make decisions that it's kind of like what do you really do with those results? Like, I don't look, I'm not an expert on this. So, but I'm just saying the kind of, these are the main criticisms against it. So what they found is that like, pretty much they're like, okay, but since we now know that people are like terrible at this, right? Are these results actually valid or do they not really tell us what we think they do? So I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Uncertainty. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So no, they're really interesting experiments. My thinking is like, and obviously I'm not a neuroscientist, but my thinking is that for us as like human beings, like with love, the same thing, I think it's with free will. Like we don't understand and we don't know all of the factors involved in our decisions. So I think because there's that mystery there and we get the sense that we're making the decision, that it's easy for us to say of like, oh, it could have been otherwise. But I think if we knew all of the factors underlying our decision, mm -hmm. it's very likely we don't have free will. It's very likely that it couldn't have been otherwise if we knew everything that was involved. Yeah, I mean, even just for fun, even if we, it's, wherever you come off on this that debate, right? Uh, we still have uh, the ability to be aware of uh, our experience, right. this metacognitive awareness, yeah. the ability to decide how you want to react. Yep. And by the way, just to kind of take this even into the realm of psychology, right? So you don't, you guys obviously know how like people self-sabotage, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like mm -hmm. common, right? So for us, like we think like, oh, that doesn't make rational sense, right? So it seems like a, like an exercise of free will, right? Because it's like, oh, if there was determinism, then obviously that person would act in their best interest, right? That would make sense. 
But if you yes. talk to a person who has a pattern of self-sabotaging, they actually are acting in their best, like in their own benefit. It's just that their reasoning mm -hmm. is really poor. So if you can actually, through therapy, convince them that, first of all, self-sabotaging is actually ruining their lives in the long term. And then the second thing is that they actually are going to get the results that they would want if they did the thing that obviously wasn't based on anxiety, right? If they, I don't know, went after a love interest or if they pursued some sort of profession, right? If you can convince them that there's a very good chance that A, either they're going to get it or B, even if they don't, it doesn't necessarily indicate their inferiority, then all of a sudden they start making better decisions. So one can argue huh. when you put in new variables, right, they're actually making the choices that you would predict them to make. Mm. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's so could it have been otherwise then if like the person with who's, um, let's say, self-tabotaging is actually, actually in their minds acting in their own best interests? I would say I don't think so. Hmm. Yeah. Because like, yeah, so when people self-sabotage, like what they do is they pretty much avoid, right? Or they pretty much do things that are, let's say, in the short term, like, um, what's the word? In the short term... Uh, pleasurable, right? So they either avoid or they engage in pleasurable activities, right? So self-sabotage might be, I don't know, um, let's say before I have like, I go out and, you know, in, do like a public speech, I decide to get drunk before, right? So rather than thinking the long-term effects, right, in their minds, they're like, oh, this is actually a really good decision because I'm feeling really anxious right now and drinking the alcohol is going to make me feel less anxious. So therefore, I'm resolving my anxiety. So I'm acting in the best interest of my own sort of on my own behalf. So if you think about it that way, I think everybody acts on their own own behalf in some sort of way right the problem is that people who self-sabotage just make bad decisions and if you teach them how to make better decisions and they agree with it by the way because that's the other thing they have to actually believe that those are better decisions then they start acting making then they start making better decisions and their behavior is predictable mm -hmm. so it's like i don't know is there free will i argue maybe no yeah yeah <laughs> those people that are congregating in the park think that they're doing it out of their own best interest so yeah in some way so in some way they are right so if we're looking at these like cognitive distortions then pretty much they are acting in their own best interest right so if we're talking about denial and let's say if that has the emotional payoff of like alleviating anxiety, right? So it's like if I assert my freedom and therefore I feel in control and my anxiety is thus reduced, my going to the park is acting in the short term in my best interest. So rather than thinking of the long term like health consequences of being outside, only focusing on the short term alleviation of anxiety, literally by saying I am free and you can't tell me what to do helps me feel less anxious and more in control. So yeah, they are acting in their own best interest. That's what sucks. That's why we have to kind of pivot them and say, no, 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 you guys are doing the wrong thing. Even though this helps you feel less anxious, it's very similar to the person picking up a drink and then 10 drinks later going like, oh, I fucked up, man. I shouldn't have had those 10 drinks. Even though initially they were like, oh, this is going to be so fun. I'm going to get hammered tonight. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you guys uh, notice that now, at least that people are staying inside more? Mm -hmm. Not everyone's doing it, but do you feel calmer than when we first started hearing about the coronavirus yes or do you no. still f no, no why right? if anything i think my anxiety is kind of increasing day by day mm -hmm. why because the the cases increase the uh, the amount of deaths increase yes yeah that's that's part of it and also it's just naturally who like i am as a person i need to engage with others a lot like before you know before all of this i was I feel like I was crisscrossing the city and always doing something with other people all the time. Mm -hmm. And now it's just like that kind of support system has been yanked. And I, you know, I always, I didn't, I thought that this would be a lot easier than it actually is. Because mm -hmm. I was like, oh, it's going to be fine. Like I have my books and my video games. I have like a whole bunch of stuff to do. And I'm a lot more social than I thought I was. Yeah. Going into this. Same yeah. here. I, I was thinking, oh, okay. Listen, I, I've done this before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like there, there have been times, there have been summers that have gone by. Mm -hmm. this, is old, this is years ago. Right. But I was able to stay inside every single day, order food, play video games, mm -hmm. watch TV, watch Prince Repeat every single day, right? right? For a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that it was going to be something similar this time, but not really. It's actually hard to even concentrate on things that yeah. I want to accomplish. I'll start thinking about what's going on out there. Sometimes I'll go in and out of it. I'll, what's a good, oscillate, mm -hmm. vacillate? Yeah, oscillate. I'll oscillate between different uh, paradigms. I'll, I'll think, okay, uh, I'm home, so I'm now thinking about things to do at home and I'm actually kind of relaxed. I'm in some kind of a mode, right? Mm -hmm. Then there's uh, other times where it's like, 
I'm too aware of what's going on in the news, mm -hmm. or I heard something late at night. Mm -hmm. Like it's already 11 p.m. and one of my friends is posting a new coronavirus <laughs> update, and I'm like, "Stop doing that, Liz. Stop." <laughs> it's not. It's not Liz. <laughs> but like, you know, it's at 10 or 11. I'm like, "Oh, really? Yeah. On a weekday before we're all going to sleep, you know?" Yeah. Blah blah blah. But uh, so it's it's a bit of a challenge, but. Um, I guess, what are you guys doing to stay grounded amidst the chaos? Who goes first? I've been, uh, binge watching Cheers, and that's helping. I feel Where like everybody that. knows your <laughs> name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I've literally been, um, watching reality television and also, like, working a lot. So, like, work has actually, like, really helped me. So, uh, on the one hand, it kind of sucks, obviously, because a lot of people are depressed right now. But then on the other hand, just feeling important and, like, what I do matters has been really meaningful and helpful to me. Honestly, yeah... Yeah, uh, st stuff like doing this podcast, yeah. for example, there's there's meaning to that too. Mm -hmm. For example, even just thinking about what we're doing here, forgetting how many people listen to it, even when one person listens, it's good because what did we say? We, we're talking about the guidelines, right. actually taking them a little more seriously right. than some people have. Mm -hmm. Also, technically, we talked about what we do mm -hmm. when uh, amidst all this. Right. The, you know, we'll have group chats. We're gonna have a watch party later. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, by the way, for anyone at home who is using Zoom, this is the best thing ever. There's an option where you could change your virtual, like your background, and it's the funnest. One of our friends, Michael, uh, I won't say what he put in the background, but he put something <laughs> just amazing in the background. We all died laughing and just took screenshots, and it's just. It's, it's a good time. It's a good time for sure. So there, there's ways to still have a good time, even when things are very serious. Yeah. Um, we talked about, yeah, the, the, the importance of just being uh, knowledgeable and also setting an example, right? Mm -hmm. to, uh, so that other people can also socially distance and kind of do their part, yeah. right? So, I mean, I think what we're doing, is, in a sense, it's meaningful because it's like, it's like a service, right? We're, we're telling other people kind of how we're getting through it and also kind of to take things a little more seriously. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, there's tremendous meaning in that. Mm -hmm. I find meaning in other things too, like doing work. Yeah. I, I like that I have no commute to yes. go to and from work now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, there's li these little pluses. We're uh, really kind of learning to really appreciate the little things during all this. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Like every time that we, yeah, we, we hop on like a, a group, uh, group call or whatever. Like that's the highlight of my day. Just kind of the ability to connect with all of you guys. And you know, it's, it's nice. <laughs> right back at you, kid. We, you know, people need people. We all need each other. That's true. So. Yeah. And actually it's, I'm happy you said that, that also the seriousness of like the gravity of what's, what's happening. Mm -hmm takes away from other whatever problems I had before this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There are things that I would concentrate on, little things, mm -hmm. uh, in interactions with people or mm -hmm. things I would think about maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, not as much as you'd think, but just to whatever degree. Right. And then, then you start thinking about life and death. Mm -hmm. You start thinking about your friends, your family. You want everyone to be safe and, and good and healthy. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, it, it actually puts you in a different sort of mindset that gets you to appreciate like you said the little things right. more or even even realizing that what you thought were the little things are actually big things mm -hmm. yeah so i agree yeah so guys you're about ready to start wrapping up we could we could how, how long have we gone i think over an hour oh we went about an hour yeah okay cool. Liz, any uh words of wisdom for our audience Especially in terms of values and what you found to be important through all of this. Uh, my my first recommendation is stay the hell inside, please. The sooner that everyone does that, the sooner that we can, you know, have regain a sense of normalcy. Mm -hmm. And although although it is difficult, reach out to other people as much as you can. I feel like my my thumbs have been reduced to nubs just because I'm texting a lot more and connecting with everybody I can. Yeah. Uh, and there's, it's, you know, it's very, it's kind of, it's very validating to consistently keep in touch and have other people reach out to you as well. And all we have is each other. Yeah. 
that's all we got. And uh, it's going to get better, even though it's all open ended and there's uh, there's no timeline. But once this is over, we're going to look back and be like, oh, we had all I had all that free time. I could have done A, B and C. So think about those A, B and C's that you want to do and then just try to get in the zone and focus in on that. And you will temporarily forget the situation that we're currently in. I love that. And uh, it's going to get better. Um, and we're New Yorkers. We're strong. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There you go. Yeah. As, as far as my input, uh, I'll just support one, everything that Liz said. Mm -hmm. And two, yeah, if, if there's something that with all this free time that maybe you can accomplish something meaningful to you, mm -hmm. something that you think uh, would be beneficial to other people yeah. or maybe even selfishly who knows mm -hmm. just to just to do something different or mm -hmm. something to maybe pass the time to mm -hmm. get you through this yeah please you know please go for it for me uh for instance uh now that i've experienced a tremendous like shift in my schedule with all this free time right. again i'm listen I, I forgot what this is like it feels actually kind of liberating in a sense i'd listen to all these uh podcasts and, and like what i used to do so, for example, in one day, let's say I'd listen to half of one podcast or one. Right. At this point, maybe I could knock out three. I can read a book. Mm -hmm. I, can, I have enough energy at the end of the day where I don't feel swamped from having worked and mm -hmm. commuted and gym and all this kind of... Oh, yeah, gym is closed, right? So, actually, even if somebody doesn't like working out, I do recommend maybe a little bit at home, a little activity. Mm -hmm. It'll... It'll boost your... You have to mention the gym, didn't you? Not the gym. Just a little activity will actually boost your mood. It's scientifically proven to boost your mood. It's not a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, so I'm working on that because I was used to the gym so much mm -hmm. that whatever I'm doing at home now really pales into comparison. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's something that's kind of shifting and changing as time goes by. Mm -hmm. So like little little things I can add to my routine with all this free time, It's it's... There's an opportunity for that now that I'm staying inside and doing my part as far as that goes. I got gotcha. um, One thing I'd also recommend is uh, I believe there are uh, places you could donate. Mm -hmm. I don't have a link up uh, at the moment, but I believe that if you know anyone who's a um, healthcare worker mm -hmm. uh, could volunteer uh, wherever they are um, to help out with the um, this whole Corona business. And, uh, yeah, if, if you can't, if you could donate and you're well within your means to be able to do that, yeah. uh, highly recommend. If no, then no, nobody's pushing you. Yeah. yeah. What about, what about you? Okay. So my thing is going to be that freedom is only contextually good. And it's something that we talked about with, um, I think se well, several people, right? We talked about this with Hiram last week and we talked about this with Darren Kaufman several weeks ago, that sort of mo morality and the decisions that we make are only sort of contextually, I guess, contextually significant. And what I mean by that is that we can't apply the same sort of ideas all across the board because context always matters. And I think it's the same thing for freedom. So in this country, we obviously think of freedom as being this sort of ubiquitously wonderful thing, even though in this particular context, limited freedom or less freedom is actually the best thing for all of us. Mm. That's it. All right, guys. Good all right. Great well, show. Uh, Liz, you probably don't mind to stay on for this. So you mind if we do a little promotion before we end sure. off? Absolutely. Right. Okay, so for okay. the audience at home, if you want to follow us, follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, and at Seize underscore Podcast on Twitter. Hit like, like, hit like bell. our video. Hit the bell. <laughs> hit follow, the bell. subscribe. And we're also about to promote. Yes. Yes. So this will take one second. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> for the audience at home. Sorry, guys. Oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> wow, this is like a really lengthy conversation. Okay. <laughs> no, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Are you stressed out that you can't leave the house to keep up with routine? Fighting with chronic conditions such as diabetes and hypertension? Having trouble coming up with healthy ways to feed the family? Or simply need that support system set up to make your goals a reality? Vera with Verified Nutrition offers a 15-minute consultation on her website at v e r a f i e d n u t r i t i o n dot com. So you can read more about her individual journey, her experiences, send her a message, check out her blog page and the services she offers and make the choice to get verified. 
That's right. Excellent. <laughs> oh, and uh, I, uh, I, I recently made a Twitter. Oh, so let's get if it. Anyone, if anyone feels like following me, uh, I'm at Liz is sentient. Um, Liz is sentient. Liz I S. No, L I Z I S, right? In terms L-I-Z-I-S, of L I Z I S. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, Liz is and sentient. S E N T I E N T. That is right. All right. Awesome. I'm Thank you, you right so away. much for coming on, man. <laughs> No problem. Thank you for having me. All right, let's talk soon. See you guys next week for episode 47.